we're looking at fish oils. I've put up the capsules. Um, I guess if you are particularly worried about eating fish for whatever reason, you can use fish oils. Bear in mind that might get you the fish oils, it doesn't get you that whole range of other nutrients, and there is some evidence that it's better to have all the nutrients that come in fish. They all seem to work together uh, to improve health rather than just the fish oils. But the fish oils do work in so many cases, and a lot of um, studies do show that. Anyway, we'll move on. So, this, this thing, puffers, you've probably seen puffers written. You might have seen it on, um, as written as polyunsaturated fats. When you look on a packet of nutrition, and particularly when it's something with high fats, they'll often say fats, and then they'll say saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. And probably the last 30 years, we've been told to eat more polyunsaturated uh, oils. What they didn't tell us is it's a slightly complex picture. There are basically two kinds, and within those there are two subdivisions of these polyunsaturated oils. So there are the ones called the N6s, and in a minute we'll be looking at another column called the N3s. They've got another name, some scientists write N, some write the Greek omega. So you would have heard of omega-3 and omega-6, it's also called N3 and N6. They are essential. That means if you took out of someone's diet all of the N3s and N6s, they would get iller and iller and die. They are absolutely essential. Our bodies cannot manufacture them. You have to take them in the diet. So in that sense, they're more like a vitamin because they have to be there. You have to make sure you're ingesting them. Okay, so we'll look at the N6s first. Um, I said there's two subdivisions, and this is because you have basically the plant sources and the animal sources. The plant sources are sometimes called the short chain N6s. So the common one that we know the name of, linoleic acid, LA, you may have heard that term, you may not. But it's, it's very highly concentrated in most of the vegetable oils. So sunflower oil is very, very high, it's nearly entirely linoleic acid. Things like nuts also contain a fairly high percentage of linoleic acid. It basically comes from seeds and nuts, because what we call vegetable oils are actually seed oils. They come from the seed of... Uh, corn oil comes from corn, which is a seed. Um, sunflower oil comes from the seed of sunflower plant. So what we call vegetables really should be called seed oils. So we've got the N6s. The, our body makes some use of them, but really it wants to turn them into the following. It wants to turn them into the long versions, which is called arachidonic acid. So when you eat some linoleic acid, maybe because you've used some vegetable oil in your cooking, um, some of that gets converted by enzymes into arachidonic acid, which is the one that our brain uses. So eating the vegetable oils does indirectly get you some of these essential brain nutrients. It's not just used in the brain, it's used in other places, I'll mention that in a minute. However, if you eat eggs and meat as being two very good examples, you get the preformed long chain. You don't require the enzymes to convert the linoleic acid into the arachidonic acid, you're taking it indirectly. However, most people are fairly efficient at doing this conversion. Um, so what you find is people that don't want to eat animal products, they can actually get quite enough um, arachidonic acid from linoleic acid by eating a vegetarian diet, so that works. What do we need the AA for, whether we get it starting from here or whether we get it directly from here? Um, it's used in lots of aspects of cells, um, it helps the cells be flexible in the brain, skeletal muscle. Now the reason that eating meat gives you it is because it goes into forming muscle. So arachidonic acid is in your muscles. It also for, uh, creates or is used as the basis for creating the prostaglandins, which some of which I mean they have a um, whole variety of hormonal functions. Um, they also are the basis of some of the hormones associated with stress response. Doesn't mean automatically it's going to make you more stressed, but there are situations where it does raise um, stress response in the body. It's also absolutely essential that when you exercise, your body responds by growing. So if you're deficient in arachidonic acid, 
then exercise won't lead to uh, growth. When we eat these puffers, the other thing they do is they go into um, every cell in your body. Now, the outline of every cell, these are cheek cells, which you might have at school put cheek cells under the microscope and looked at them. They're very large cells in our mouth. Um, but you can see there the nucleus in the middle, and they're basically little blobs. The outside edge of them is where these puffers end up. So if you take from anybody's body some cells, it could be blood cells, it could be body cells, and you put it through something to analyse the fats that are in it, you can basically predict what they've been eating. So you can tell the difference between a vegetarian who's eating lots of this and will have lots of linoleic acid in that cell, um, compared to somebody that's eating less of this and more of the long chain ones, they'll have more of the arachidonic acid and less of the linoleic acid. So the fats you eat literally become you. The cells in your body reflect what you've eaten, and that will be virtually every cell. The brain's a little bit more selective and it kicks out the things it doesn't want, so the brain will be slightly different, but basically the rest of the body will respond to the, the fats that you've eaten. Okay, so let's go to the other side, the N3 or the omega-3s. Um, the short chain one is called alpha linolenic acid. Again, it's mainly found in um, nuts, so nuts are actually 50%, well not 50, the, the ratios vary, but they're partly omega-3, N3s, partly omega-6. Rapeseed oil is quite an exception. Rapeseed is quite low in the N6s and quite high in the N3s. So particularly for vegetarians, they should be heading for the rapeseed oil to get a balance of both, or nuts give you a balance of both. Grass-fed meat, when animals are not fed grains but are out on the pasture, um, so this is a popular movement at the moment, to eat meat from animals that's been out on grass, eat eggs from animals that have been out on grass, that increases the proportion of the alpha-linolenic acid in, in the meat, in the eggs that you eat. So that's another way of increasing it. Um, over there that's um, flax seed, so linseed. That's the flax plant from which we get linseed. Linseed also is high in alpha linolenic acid, which is the short chain N3. Again, they do have some function in the body, but primarily the thing that we really need is the longer chain ones. And so we do have enzymes that can take the ALA and can convert it into the long forms. And down here is the one that in the fish oil capsules, well, as FIFA mentioned, it's actually got EPA and the DHA come preformed in the fish oils. So basically you get those from eating oily fish and crustacean. They all are very high in DHA. They also have some of the AA in them. So if you're eating fish, you actually get both sides, but you get a very, a very good dose of the, the DHA. And this is the one that dietarily humans have problems getting. We don't have, in our modern world, we don't have any problems with the short chain. We eat so many vegetable oils, everything you buy that's cooked in oil, it's vegetable oils. Nobody cooks in lard anymore. So we're getting actually a lot of those uh, short chain fats. Unfortunately, we don't get as much of this one. So we're mostly making the side that's not up there at the moment, making less of this side. But if you eat fish, you're getting these directly. I don't need to press that down. So what's it involved in? DHA, um, brain development, so is the AA, they're both necessary. But it's absolutely critical in neurons. So the actual cells that are doing the communication, and remember your brain is not all neurons, it's not all brain cells. It's actually mostly cells called glial cells that look after the neurons. They're kind of, um, yeah, like protectors. So more than half your brain is cells that look <coughs> after your neurons. But the neurons, that's where the DHA ends up. And particularly in the eye, the retina is very, very high in DHA. So we can imagine that uh, if we're in a society that's not getting enough DHA, it will affect the eyes as well as the brain. It also has these effects on the heart, blood pressure, and it can reduce inflammation. Right, so of the LA and ALA that we take in, that's the short chain ones, it's the ones the vegetarians and vegans can only get because they're not, unless they're supplementing, they don't eat foods that contain the long ones. Um, nearly all of it, surprisingly, our bodies burn. Now you would think, wouldn't you, if this can be converted into this, and we absolutely have to have DHA, 
you would think our bodies would take any ALA we've got and by its enzymes convert it into DHA. But it doesn't. It actually takes something like over 80% of the ALA and it just burns it as though it was a fuel like glucose or other fats, saturated fats. It just burns it. And then a little bit of it is stores. As we said, all these cells get a little bit of ALA in them. And a little bit, it breaks down and turns into other fats. It uses it as building. You just think, what are you doing, body? Why are you not turning it into this stuff? Less than 5% actually gets converted. So although we can try and live on these, we're actually really limiting the amount of DHA and EPA we get in our bodies because this conversion process is not very efficient. Here's some of the details of this. In Canada, take the Canadian population, I don't know why Canada, it's just where the study was done, 11% um, of them can't actually do this conversion, they can't make their own DHA. They're going to be really in trouble unless they're getting it in the long form. Eastern China, 50% of the population can't make DHA. And the Inuit can't make it at all. So that's because they haven't needed to, they've been so from millennia been eating fish that they've actually lost the ability to bother making it as far as their genes are concerned. They live in a world full of DHA. Why bother having enzymes to convert it? So in the end, of the ALA that you eat, less than 1% ends up as DHA. Some, there's a bit of controversy over quite the amount, but some think it's as low as 0.1%. So it really is a very inefficient process. Whereas when you eat it directly, you get 7 to 20 times as much DHA. Now that might sound a little bit odd, but that's because even when you eat DHA, that doesn't automatically mean it all ends up in your body useful. Some of it is not digested, some of it gets broken down, um, some of it doesn't reach the cells of your body. So, but still, we're going to go for these forms because it is at least 7, maybe 20 times as effective at raising the DHA in my body as starting from up here. Okay, I'm going to talk about, a little bit about DHA and its function and its history. DHA is an incredibly ancient molecule that has not changed. It came about, that's a long time ago, isn't it? 1.6 billion years. 1,600 million years ago, DHA um, was first formed by algae in the oceans. Okay, so how long went by before anything else managed to start using it significantly? Uh, quite a long time, a um, thousand million years. So we'll go forward to 600 million years, and that's when the first nervous systems evolved. And those nervous systems used the DHA that they were getting from the algae around them. 600 million years ago, and then right up to the present, they've never, evolution, they, evolution has never found a substitute for DHA. It's still used for the same function for the nervous system, no other molecule will do. This is incredible. Virtually every other molecule, you trace it back through history, it's changed. The body's worked out how to make it structurally slightly different, to perform a different job, to do something differently. DHA, this is why it's such a critical nutrient. It's always been there. It's absolutely essential to nervous system. Everything with a nervous system, nothing else will do the job. Let's have a look at what happens. I said that these fats go into the cell membrane. So we've zoomed in here. This is a cell going around in a big circle like that. This is looking at the layer on the outside of the bubble, the membrane that makes up that cell. And all cell membranes are composed of pairs of molecules sitting head to head. They look like sperm cells for some reason in this picture. But um, they're called phospholipids, and they are what make up every cell in your body, on the surface. Okay, so when we have any of the puffers, whether they're DHA, AA, LA, all those different names, AA, what happens is they come and sit inside that membrane. So what we've got here, uh, that's cholesterol. These are the normal saturated fatty acids. I'll just go back, so that's these. They're normally saturated fats or monounsaturated fats. And we also have cholesterol, and cholesterol is a really important molecule in the body, can't live without it. Cholesterol molecule usually sits inside that layer on the outside of the cell. So the next slide shows us what happens when you have puffers. When you have puffers, they're not straight, they're kind of kinked, they're almost spiral shaped. 
And what they do is they stop that sort of almost continuous layer from being continuous. They break it up. They make it a little bit more fragile, or more accurately, they make it more fluid. So we all know what solid butter's like when you take it out of the fridge. It's very stiff, very hard. Whereas if you take oils out of the fridge, they're still running. So by having some of these polyunsaturated oils inside the membrane, it actually makes the membrane more flexible. It also, they now are starting to find, it also allows very important, sorry, that one, very important signaling and receptor molecules. Now, the membrane of every cell needs to take stuff in and take stuff out. So it has receptors and channels that let through important things. This receptor or ion channel has been manufactured inside the cell. The cell wants that to go up into the surface layer of the cell, into the lipid layer, so that important chemicals can come in and out under the control of the cell. It turns out that where the puffers arrange is either side of these receptors, and if you haven't got enough puffers, you get fewer of the receptors on the cells. So the cell can't do its job as well because you're not providing it with the opportunity to plant its receptors in the surface. So a very important function of the polyunsaturated fats. And in particular, DHA has a pivotal role out of all of them. So, looking in detail now at a neuron, at a synapse. So coming down from the top of the red, you can imagine is one of those uh, dendrites that FIFA showed us growing out from one nerve cell in the brain. And it's coming up and it's meeting a second nerve cell, green, at the bottom. And they never touch. They leave a little gap called a synaptic junction. And a chemical signal has to pass across that junction. So what we've got, the white wiggly line coming down here, that's the nerve impulse, electrical nerve impulse. And the only way it can stimulate the electrical nerve impulse in the next neuron, the next nerve cell, is by some chemicals that are released and jump across that gap. And these are absolutely critical. If this isn't functioning optimally, you literally think slower. You get slow. So this ability to think to send signals quickly depends on the speed that these chemicals can travel across the gap. Now, this is one of those membranes that we were just talking about. If it is enriched with DHA, these little bubbles with the chemicals in can be released quicker. In fact, these little bubbles which are manufactured that contain the uh, neurotransmitter chemicals, they themselves are made of that membrane. So if this little bubble here has DHA in it, then it can literally release the neurotransmitter quicker because it's more fluid. It's like when you blow bubbles in a bubble pipe, it works well if the bubbles can form quickly and bubble off. If I put some very thick washing up liquid in there, the bubbles are slower, they come off slower. And that's what's happening here. And the speed of the synaptic junction, therefore, literally depends on the DHA in your diet that therefore gets into your brain, that therefore allows these junctions to function as fast as they possibly can. Okay, so when they burst here and let out the neurotransmitters, some of the DHA, some of the AA, those long-chain polyunsaturated fats, end up in this space in here. Some of them are then recycled and taken back in, but some of them get lost. So that means the ones that are lost are kind of, you can treat them as though they're used up. They end up going somewhere else, getting broken down. They don't end up back where they started. So effectively, thinking consumes DHA. Simply by being alive, having an active nervous system, you're using about 4.6 milligrams of DHA and 17.8 milligrams of AA just to have a nervous system that's functioning. Going back to them, right? There, there remind, remind you, these are the short chain ones that come from the vegetable sources of food. At the bottom here are the ones that come preformed from the animal products. These are the ones that are functioning in the brain. We have another issue going on, not mentioned yet, but you mentioned over here. Those enzymes that turn the short chain omega 6 into the long, and these enzymes that turn the short chain omega 3s into the long, are the same enzyme. It's the same enzyme that does both jobs. What that means is 
one button, is that we have competition to use those enzymes. What that means in effect is, if I eat lots and lots of this, then this enzyme is not available for converting this. In the modern diet, we eat a lot of this. This is ubiquitous. This is what everyone's put in the food because we're also afraid of saturated fat. You're cooking in lard. You're cooking vegetable oils now. So we've got tons of this stuff. And that means that these enzymes, which remember were so ineffective anyway, it was only a very small fraction of the production, we've now got the problem that this one is grabbing the enzyme and there's no enzymes left for this one. That's the theory. Let's see how that worked out in practice. So first thing, as I said, since what, what date's that? 19, 1909. 1909, we only had just under 15% of our diet, uh, sorry, 15 grams, that is, not percent of diet, 15 grams a day of these sorts of oils were in our diet. And then we've got that whole thing of, you've got to eat more of these, these are good for you. Big explosion, all the shelves filled with flora, nobody wanted to eat butter anymore, and vegetable oils, because they're healthier than cooking in lard, aren't they? So that came in, and look, this is the amount it went up. That's the short chain linoleic acid, the omega-6, really increased. These studies, every orange circle <coughs> is a scientific study, completely separate studies, where they found some people, measured how much of their cells was linoleic acid. If you go back to 1960, whole cluster, 1960-65, all these experiments found the average amount of linoleic acid in subcutaneous fat, that's fat under the skin, was 7%, 8%. Come up to 2010, and they're now finding it's 23-24%. This line here, which is an incredible straight line, isn't it? I mean, isn't that remarkable that just random studies all form this straight line? Um, this is showing how much we're transforming our bodies. Why have we got the chimpanzee on there? It's because if you take more or less any animal, any mammal, certainly any mammal closely related to humans, just like the people back in the 60s, they, from their natural diet, have about 8% LA in the body. We've done something. Because of this edict to eat more of this stuff, which we've all followed, so have all factories, so has McDonald's. McDonald's used to cook their fries in, was it? Lard. It wasn't lard, it was um, dripping, I think. I think it was dripping. Well, yeah. They used to cook them in dripping, or yeah, or which is beef, fat. beef fat. Um, and then this came along and everyone said, oh no, you shouldn't be cooking with animal fats. They swapped over to cooking in this and we've all had this massive ingestion and it's changing our bodies. Like literally never in the history of the world. There we were talking about the last two, three million years of evolution. What you're seeing here is 50 years of evolution. This is, no one knows what this means. We have no idea what that means. It's completely new. Do you want to be part of that experiment? Probably you already are. But you can reverse it because you can stop eating all those vegetable oils. You just don't need them. They're not essential. Small amount is. The amount we eat now is not. So we don't know what that's doing. But we've got a bit of a clue. I'm going to bring in breast milk here because it's so pivotal to our whole story about the way that it's not just your health, it's generational, it's our society, it's all of our children and their offspring. Um, breast milk also reflects diet. So when baby's suckling, um, the puffers, the polyunsaturates that the baby's getting, 30% of them come from what the mother's eaten. So if she's eating a lot of vegetable oils, and then the baby is indirectly eating a lot of those vegetable oils. 70% come from her fat stores. Um, we're going to talk about this in a minute. But the overall lipid content that the baby gets does depend on her diet. It reflects her diet. Because even what she's got stored just reflects her diet from a year or two ago the last few years. So what the baby gets is effective what the mother gets. Let's have a look at this. This is, this side, the two bars, this graph here, is showing linoleic acid in breast milk, 1981 to 2000. So the amount of linoleic acid in the breast milk has gone up. The vegetable oil, short chain puffers, has increased, just like we saw it has in the whole population. Remember that we said that when you have too much of that, the body cannot manufacture as much of the DHA because of that competition. So when we then look at the same thing but with DHA in the breast milk, it has gone down. 
So you've almost got a substitution. By having all that vegetable oil, you force out DHA. It might also be that people don't eat as much fish, but there's definitely a pattern there that fits in with our hypothesis. Okay, so what about if you're vegan or vegetarian? Well, if you're vegan or vegetarian, then remember you're not eating any DHA directly, or at least very little. You are relying on those enzymes that do the conversion. So what we've done in this graph is for the omnivores <coughs> that we know are getting the long chain DHA, we've made all of their graphs 100%. So what we're doing is we're comparing in yellow is vegan and green is vegetarian, we're comparing their breast milk, this is vegan breast milk, vegetarian breast milk, compared to an omnivore's breast milk. And we're comparing them all to the omnivore by making the omnivore's amounts all 100%. So linoleic acid, the vegetable oil one, the one that we're eating too much of now, what you find is vegans have loads of it in their breast milk, more than twice as much as an omnivore. And the vegetarians have nearly twice as much as the omnivores. The alpha linolenic acid, there's less of that in the diet in the first place, um, but the vegans and the vegetarians have got loads of that. So what they've got, they've got all this short chain fatty acids, but nowhere near as much of the long chain. Come over to the DHA, and the vegetarians have less in their breast milk, and the vegans have a lot less, about near, getting on for nearly a third of what an omnivore eats. And these are just average people. We're not saying this is someone that's a high fish eater, just a standard omnivore. What we're seeing there is that your choices about what you eat literally affect your child, because this is what the children are getting. The vegan and vegetarian children are getting more of the short chain, less of that essential long chain brain building nutrient. So this is a massive study. All of those little things, you can probably barely read them, maybe I can get them in better focus. They are different countries. I like going to better focus. There we go, that's better, isn't it? And uh, what we've got is um, their children. So we've got up the side here, this is maths scores from International Standardised Maths Test. These are the maths scores of children. And along the bottom, we've got the amount of DHA in the mother's milk. So what we've got, where you get the most DHA, it's where they have either the most fish consumption or the most of the N3 and the lower of the vegetable oils. And what you get is, it's not a perfect trend, there's loads of other factors that affect how good people are at maths, but what we've got is the countries with the highest amount of DHA, N3 fats, omega-3 fats, and they are getting, that's on a trend at least, they're getting some very high maths scores. You've got places like Finland that are on par, but there is a definite trend line through that that is considered significant. If we move on to this one, a really interesting study here. This is um, maternal milk, so that's the milk from the mother. And what they looked at this time is the ratio of the DHA and the LA. And what they did is they took the breast milk and then they said, right, we're going to split you into the quarter of you that has the highest amount of linoleic acid. We'll put you up here. So you're obviously eating a lot of vegetables. And we'll put up here the 25% of you that are eating the most N3 oils. And we'll put the rest of you into two other groups in between. So they're called quartiles. And then what we'll look at is how your children do on um, a set of tests. So this is the average for three tests they gave these children. And um, it was done across a sample of 28 countries. So it's not just from one country. And what they found was, as you can see, the more DHA, the better the IQ or the maths test. And the other way around, the more of the linoleic acid so it's not just less DHA, it's literally more linoleic acid, more of the short chain one, vegetables. The worst thing <coughs> is, this is what you were saying about the ratio of the two. When you start to have more of the N6s, you get less of the N3s. Ask the question as well. Is there any research that compares it to all milk babies as well? I, I, mean, I don't know what the levels are. They have got much better at making sure that formula milk contains DHA and mm -hmm. AA. Um, they're not there entirely. There's other things that need to be in breast milk that still need to get right to make it all work properly. Um, I think, I mean, I haven't got the studies here, but from, just from memory from the ones I've been looking at, um, there is a difference. But when they, when they do a study on 
formula, they nearly always look at formula that doesn't have DHA versus formula that does. They're trying to see how good they can make the formula milk. And it definitely works. Putting it in works. Um, the same as taking fish oil capsules works. Would a poor diet, if you were breastfeeding and you had a poor diet with lower DHA fats, you might be better giving your baby formula? <laughs> it's so easy yeah. to get right for the mother to eat properly or take. Yeah. I, I would say let's let's not mess around. I guess if you've got a particular case where she's really deficient and it's just clearly not going to resolve, and then the best thing to do would be to give it directly to the baby, wouldn't it? But um, the mother would depend on the first trimester. I didn't say that in iodine. It depends on the first trimester of pregnancy for the baby to get the iodine in the first three months of pregnancy. Yeah, so, and that's probably true for other things. As I well. think I think it's okay later on, but we'll come yeah. to that. Yeah. 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 Um, you're talking about um, like linseed and grape seed oil. Um, I was wondering where coconut oil sits with that and what other. Coconut doesn't have doesn't any have, significant and amounts of other ones. Avocado is mostly mono. Avocado is mostly mono. I don't know the exact quantity. No, it doesn't really come into it. Yeah. The, I mean, if, if you're looking for short chain ones specifically, I'd say why aren't you looking for the long chain ones? Um, mm. So, if you want specifically short chain ones, it will be the flaxseed, um, the oh, nuts. Oh, and uh, walnut. Yeah, walnuts. Walnuts is the best ratio in the first place. Walnuts has the best ratio of ALA to LA, whereas some of the it other still nuts needs to be you get too much of the LA. It still needs to be inverted. And if it's been all converted down the other pathway, you end yeah. up with a load of AA, and AA. Without DHA to balance it, is highly inflammatory, which is probably why we're seeing this absolute extraordinary upsurge in inflammatory conditions. We're having so much air. So, all sorts of inflammatory conditions. Carry on, kid. Again, fish oil capsules. If you really don't want to eat fish, fish oil capsules. And I still have a very good one. Um, this one's interesting because it's about what happens with the first child, second child, third child. In fact, all they've looked at here is the first and third pregnancy. But what we've got here, that colour, what's that? Dark blue and the cyan. First pregnancy, third pregnancy. So we're looking at the amount of DHA in the mother's blood at 22 weeks. Let's just focus on that one. So at 22 weeks, she had more DHA in her first pregnancy than her second. So what this is about, oh sorry, with third, it's third pregnancy. What this is about is every time a woman has a baby, typically the levels of DHA that she has and that the baby gets go down and down and down. They believe this is probably powerful enough to be a major factor in the observation that the first child is usually the brightest. Of course, none of these things are fixed. Everything there is somewhat, there's fluctuations and randomness in this. But there is this long-standing observation that second and third children are not as bright as the first. And they believe it may be possibly almost entirely down to the DHA depletion. So then here, what, this is also interesting because what we've got 22 weeks and then at delivery, why did it go down? Because the mother's DHA has gone to the baby. So between 22 weeks and delivery, the baby has taken some of her DHA. Now visualise this, carrying the baby, it is literally sucking DHA out of the mother. The mother's brain levels of DHA go down during pregnancy and may contribute to postnatal depression. It's not entirely proved, but it's definitely on the cards. So, of course, when she comes back for the second child and the third child, unless she's really boosted her own omega-3s in the meantime, then the next child, she's starting from a lower base, passing some on to that child, and so, so it goes on. And then what we see in the baby is... Um, it doesn't really, the difference here, the vein and the artery, this is just the blood coming to the baby from the mother has high levels of DHA and what goes back to the mother has got lower levels so the baby's kept some of it for itself, that's just all that's illustrating. But again, second baby gets less, sorry, third baby it is, isn't it? Second would be somewhere in between, we presume. Um, however, if you take countries where the mothers have very, very high DHA, such as Japan and 
other countries that are big fish eaters, then although the mother's levels come down, the baby's levels don't go up as much. The baby seems to know, I don't need that much, and it will rise to a certain point, and then it will stop taking more than it needs. So in Japan, yes, the mother's level of DHA comes down, but it's still not below what the baby needs. So next time she has a baby, yes, it comes down again, but the baby still gets to the maximum it needs. We start on the other side. As mothers, we start lower than what the baby needs. So it has to suck it out of us to get enough, and it literally will. It won't let the baby down. The baby will try and take what it can. And so the mother will end up more and more depleted. So the Japanese have got it right. Their babies, I presume, I haven't seen an exactly the same one, but what you would assume is that this bar would be the same height for the baby. It would be gradually coming down from the mother, but she's always got more than enough for the baby. So the babies each time should be able to get up to the maximum. Another reason why we should be eating more fish, or at least improving our own three status. Here's an interesting one. The mother, this is a study of the mother's anxiety during pregnancy. And what we've got here is the more N3 from seafood, the lower the odds of her being depressed. Or, sorry, anxious was the term used. So there's a link between the amount of DHA she's got and her anxiety during pregnancy. Which is probably all that neurological function in her brain. You know, when it's slower or, or she feels there's something yeah, not right. The baby's pulling all of her DHA out. She's Hers gonna, is getting lower and lower. Okay, um, what else makes us human? This is the fun bit. Sexual dimorphism just means a species where you've got differences between the male and female. Um, if you're into horses, I bet some of you can look at a horse and say, without looking at its genitals, just look at a horse and say, is that a male or female? Who could do that in this room? Okay, you don't have that problem with women, do you? Men and women, we can tell the difference. Because our females are curvy, like no other animal on the planet. This is as extraordinary as our brains. Curviness. And our babies are plump, like no other baby on the planet, except one, I'll tell you about the other baby on the planet, but it's a bit like ours. Um, our babies are plump. This is really cool. Okay, so there's a lovely picture of a woman. I don't think any of us would have any problems seeing that's a woman. Um, here's a fact. Men only have 14% body fat, females have 27%. Sorry, ladies, you're all fat. <laughs> it's natural. It's actually what makes you curvy. Where's this going? What's it got to do with fish? We'll see. Okay, this lovely diagram, um, textbook like when I was at school, we had diagrams like this, hand painted and drawn. Um, what they've done is they've taken, they've sort of scaled right from newborn through to adult. They've kind of kept the height the same, and it helps you see the chubbiness because we're keeping the height the same, so you get a sense of the, the width, the chubbiness. And it's trying to illustrate how the newborn is chubby and the two-year-old's chubby. And in fact, because this is a girl's, so they're actually chubby all the way through one way or another, and we'll look at this chubbiness. It's really, really important uh, to humans in lots of ways. So at puberty, estrogen floods the body, and it stimulates fat deposits. The reason that girls change shape primarily is because they start depositing fats and they start getting their, their shape, their figure. Um, and they put on twice, more than twice as much fat during puberty as boys do. Boys put on more muscle and more bone strength and the girls put on more fat. They tend to put it on what's called the gluteofemoral areas, that is the gluteus maximus, the buttocks, the hips and the thighs. And that's mostly where it goes. So the girl will get her hips and really that process doesn't stop until she's about 22, 23, at which point it's kind of complete. Um, so yeah, so where it goes. That deposit of fat is associated with a whole host of health outcomes and chances of conceiving successfully. So in countries where there are major starvations and the girls cannot put on this fat, their bodies have a blooming good go at it though, it is amazing. The body will prioritise putting this fat on if it can at all manage it. Um, but where they're very emaciated, then um, the fertility goes down. We all know this with anorexics, lose their fertility. Um, and all sorts of health outcomes go down. It's very beneficial 
to women to, to have this. It's completely different to the fat that we put on from middle age onwards, or unfortunately today from, from the age of about 12 onwards, apparently, and it's even younger, I'm sure. In primary schools, we've got this problem, haven't we, with obesity in young people too. But that obesity, that central obesity, the fat that goes in the belly area, has got a different composition. Um, this fat the girls are putting on here is very high in DHA, very low in LA and ALA. It seems to be a deliberate store of fats that contain high levels of DHA. Here's an interesting thing. Because they put this fat on around the buttocks and thighs, it means they get curvy. They get the waist and the hips. And if the waist's narrower than the hips, then that shows their fat's gone in the right place. If it's the other way around, that means they've got some sort of obesity problem that shouldn't be there. Isn't it interesting that men and women shown pictures, you know, you can Photoshop pictures and tweak everybody to make them look different. If you do this, it's almost universal across all cultures. The number varies a little bit, but this should be 70% of this. And okay, we're looking at a width, it's actually the circumference around. You just show people pictures or models. Obviously, to make it fair, it's got to be the same model and you have to just tweak the proportions. But males, just ask them which one do you like the look of best, they go for a 70% ratio, waist to hip. And women also prefer that look. So it's not a sexist thing, it's not just men, it's men prefer it, women prefer it. I.e., we've got built into our eyes, this is good, we like that, that's what we want. Why do we want that? Fertility and health. DHA stores. We know it, it's all programmed into us. That ratio is strongly, oh, we've said that, linked to fertility and health. Right, so the ratio is not just the DHA, but that ratio. I'm going to show you some of that in a minute. Um, body mass index, this is a separate thing. Body mass index is an indication of effectively if you're overweight or not. Um, that varies depending on society. We live in a society where there's so much food, nobody really goes hungry. Consequently, we think women should be slim. We think that's cool to be slim, because it kind of shows restraint, I guess. You go to countries that are very poor, and especially where the men are hungry, they all want a fat rock. So it's not the same thing. When we think about obesity, these cultural things we all know about China, I don't know when it was, but there's all those pictures, these really fat women, that was very cool, they really like that. Um, that's a separate thing. That seems more to do with the availability of food and social preferences about what that means. She's a good wife, I'm not going to have to work so hard to feed her, look, she's already got enough stores there. Um, but this other thing, this ratio, still works. Somebody can be a particularly big person, and as long as the waist to hips right, they're still attractive. This is interesting. So this is intelligence of women measured by a number of tests done in several cohorts. So the fact we've got three coloured bars in each case is because it was either 18 to 49 year olds, 18 to 49 year olds or 14 to 16 year olds. And along the bottom here we've got the waist to hip ratio as a percentage, so that's 64%. Remember 70-ish, it varies a bit, but 70 was rough, roughly the ideal in our culture, most cultures it's around that here. And then 72, so by the time we get up here, 92, 100% would be a woman that was the same width here as here, a bit like a boy. You know, in the 20s, there was that thing about being completely straight, not having any curves, being rather androgynous. Um, what we find is that literally, the women that are more curvy are more intelligent. The women that are more straight and masculine are less intelligent. It is absolutely, in study after study, waist to hip ratio is linked to intelligence. Now, if I went back and just said, you know, nobody's going to be surprised that men like curvy women, there is something they actually look for more, although it's linked. Intelligence. All studies show men like intelligence. However, some people think that's not true. The reason it sometimes isn't true, it is true, but it's not true because of a confounder. And that is, men don't like women that have jobs that are too better than theirs. They feel pushed out, they feel like I'm not going to to look after you, I'm not going to serve you, I'm not going to fulfil my role. So, intelligence, yes, but not that you're going to actually make me look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I need to know that we're on the same kind of status. Yeah, but intelligence. So, they're picking the same thing. Intelligence. Health. Fertility. Okay, so what do the fat stores do? 
they go to the baby when it's in the uterus. Some of it goes to fit to the baby. And after the baby's born, the rest of it, the bulk of it, goes through the breast milk. Breast milk's incredibly energy expensive stuff to produce and keep producing every day. That's where it comes from. That store which has prioritised DHA kept it there for the baby. So even with restricted food intake, in other words, if you can't get enough food, gluteofemoral fat is metabolically protected from use. So she might be starving to death. Her body will say, we're not using that. That's too important to hang on. You go look for some food, though. We're not using this up. It's kept until late pregnancy and lactation, the period of maximal infant brain growth. That's when it's released. So she, for how many years, from puberty through to then, you know, whenever she has a baby, it could be for 5, 10, 15 years, she has been accumulating and storing from her diet omega-3 fats. We could call them fish oils if you like, but the omega-3 fats. She's been storing them ready for her baby. She doesn't even know it. Completely unconscious, that's what she's doing. And it won't be released until she has that baby. Someone's worked out that the IQ of the baby goes up by 0.13 points, doesn't seem a lot, for every 100 milligram increase in DHA. So the more DHA, the higher the IQ of the baby. What we looked at before was her IQ, but it also affects the baby's IQ. This is the waist to hip ratio and the offspring's intelligence. Okay, so we've got the offspring's intelligence. The high bar there is when you're at that 70%. As it goes up, 80%. 80, 90% getting more straight, more masculine shape, less feminine shape. So the bottom line is the mother's waist to hip ratio. Mother's waist to hip ratio. And the, this the, is her child's, the child's effectively IQ, but intelligence from some tests. So it definitely affects her waist to hip ratio, her deposits of N3s affect her child's intelligence. During pregnancy, her body goes, right, we've really got to store some stuff now. Now you know eating for two, that business. One of the big things is she's actually eating to put on weight herself. So two to six kilograms of fat between the 20th and 30th week, mainly on the hips and thighs. Whilst that's going on, the baby starts to put on a layer of fat as well. So there is this, towards the end of pregnancy, the last trimester, the last few months, the baby and the mother start storing fat like mad. This is showing the amount of fat on the baby in grams from week, what, roughly week 20? Week 20. It's almost zero. So up to week 20, it's almost zero. And if you look at any other mammal, it's also roughly zero. And then humans do something for the last few weeks before birth. The baby puts on fat. Now this is the baby's body fat. It's the fat the baby's laying down in the womb on itself. It goes up exponentially until it's got 500 grams of body fat on it just prior to birth. What's all that about? No other animal does that. This fat is really unique in the mammalian world. It's evenly spread across the body. Same thickness roughly all over the body. It's not lumpy. Um, it's under the skin, not between the organs. When we get a piece, it's in the central area in the organs. It's not there, it's under the skin. Very low in LA and ALA. It doesn't have the short chain fats in it hardly at all. Very high in AA and DHA. So the baby is laying down the stuff that we know it needs for its brain. It's putting it there as fat. And it's getting that DHA from its mother. So its mother is passing her DHA from her fat stores to the baby in this last kind of burst of activity and the baby grows a brain and puts this fat down on its body. So are babies really fat? You know, I'm saying fat babies, people say, well, babies aren't that fat. Well, we're not used to looking at infants of other animals. So typical body fat of newborn mammals is about 3%, whereas for humans it's 11 to 14%. That is extraordinary. It makes us not only incredible because of our brains, but because our babies are fat. There we go. Only one species of seal is born with more fat. I don't know which species it is, but there is one species born. Um, we are actually absolutely incredible as a life form that we do this. One of the main reasons preterm babies used to die is that being born early means you don't have enough fat. And that fat the baby lays is for developing its brain. So this baby has been born early it hasn't got access to its own stores of DHA or its mother's stores of DHA. It's very, very vulnerable. And 
it's recently, why they've got so good at it is they give DHA to preterm infants to help them get through. That's how important DHA is. How do they give them? I don't know. They probably don't know. How do they feed them? It's drip fed. Thank yeah. you. There we go, it's drip fed. So straight into the vein or something. I'm just going to look at the newborn baby because we say that our, our babies are special in humans. Stupid and floppy and can't do anything when they're born. With blooming big heads, difficult to get out. Let's have a look at how big that head is in that brain. So the mother's brain size 1,400 grams, baby's 400. Okay, That's 2.3% of her body weight, which remember is highest in the animal kingdom virtually. 11% of the baby's body weight is its brain. The mother's brain uses 414 calories a day. The baby uses 118. But the mother, that 414 is 23%. Remember we said that's so extraordinary about humans that a quarter of their energy is being used for our brains. No other animal does that. Well, what about our babies? 74% of the baby's energy is used by its brain. They are basically, you know, in the science fiction films of the old, there would be something from another planet that was a huge brain with a little shrunken body. <laughs> 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 So, okay. Kira, does that mean we can think ourselves soon? <laughs> yes, 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 it does. Give it a yeah, go. The, the, the people who spend the most time using their brain yeah. are slim. Yes, that's what I thought. They, 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 they. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we saw that DHA being used up by the thinking process. I guess if you're doing more thinking and using the brain more. I mean, if you look at some really clever people, they're always slim. Virtually always. Yeah, that's not a guarantee. Slim doesn't mean you're... Yeah. 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 He wasn't very clever. He was cunning, but he wasn't... Yeah. <laughs> OK, and this bit. 70% of the calories that go from the mother to the baby, 70% of them go into brain growth. And the baby can produce, that's fading right there, a quarter of a million new cells, synapses or neurons, every minute. That brain is a phenomenal growing set of neurological tissue. This graph is showing us the DHA in the brain. So this is if you took a child's whole brain and you're just thinking, well hang on, what are all these dots? This must be children's brains. How do they get hold of them? These are from miscarriages, um, accidents and so on. Okay, so that's where they've got them from. Um, but they looked at the amount of DHA in the brain at different time points. And what we see is this is in the womb. The grey section is in the womb. So it did that exponential growth in fat and in brain in the last few weeks in the womb. And then when it comes out, the brain carries on growing very, very rapidly. Where's that DHA coming from? Mostly from breast milk or formula. If it's the old days when formula didn't have DHA in it, the baby had to use its own fat stores that it had put on in the womb to try and make up for it because it wasn't getting enough DHA. Um, if you just look at the name of the paper, I've highlighted it. It's the benefits of DHA, folic acid, we prefer that to be folate, vitamin D and iodine. Now three of those, DHA, vitamin D and iodine, we've talked to today about being particularly available in fish. So it's the benefits of those on fetal and infant brain development and functioning following maternal supplementation during pregnancy and lactation. So this was a study where the, um, if they were looking to see how, how much can we improve the baby by supplementing the mother with these important vitamins. Toddlers, so babies come out, being breastfed. Around the planet, the average time for breastfeeding is about two years. And if you ever look at a two-year-old, they're chubby as hell, aren't they? Because they are putting on fat to the point where I'm not going to get any milk anymore. I've got to eat those silly vegetables and stuff you keep giving me. So how am I going to carry on growing my brain? I'm going to use my own chubbiness. So the baby will then use its own stores of DHA that it's been getting from the mother's milk, that it's been coming from the mother's buttocks and thighs, um, which came from her diet from before. This massive conservation of DHA to keep it for that baby's brain for the next generation. This is the last bit. Study done. Isn't he cute? A um, whole group of babies had this lovely um, brain scanner stuck on their heads. 
And then you would think, how do they put up with it? Um, I don't know how old they are, does it say? I think they're six months. Six months, so lovely. Um, so six months old, little scanners put on their heads, and to keep them interested, they stick toys in front of them. Now you know why he's looking like that, isn't he? And what they did is they pass the toys along, and then they take it away and put another toy there, take it away and put another toy there, take it away and put another toy there, and then sometimes they put one of the toys back again for a second look. And what they did is they record the brain waves. Now this is a kind of simplified version, but the author of the paper created it. A novel toy, this is the brain activity, a novel toy comes by. The dip is where the brain goes, what's that, I've not seen that before. This is, that's what that pulse, how it's interpreted. And then this pulse is, I'm going to remember that. Another novel toy, what's that? I don't know what that is. Oh, I'm going to remember that. Then, it's learned two toys now. You do one of them again. This is a familiar toy. It goes, oh, yeah, I already know that. And then it doesn't commit it to memory. Okay, so what's this got to do with our story? Do the same with babies that do not have sufficient DHA in their bodies, it does that. Think what that means. The red one, novel toy. What's that? I've never seen that before. Forget it. Along comes a familiar toy. What's that? I've never seen that before. Forget it. It's got a completely different brain response that indicates it is not learning. This is very recent research, 2012. I think it's pretty groundbreaking. I think it kind of brings us all the way around to the idea that DHA is nothing to be played with lightly. It's really essential for the intelligence of us, our children, our country, our planet. And what we've tried to show today is that the primary source of it, the most accessible source, is from fish. So there's a lovely picture to finish with. An Aboriginal boy, so pleased that he's got a crab. Enjoy your seat.